Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's episode of Sin and Tonic is very exciting because it is the 100th episode of Sin and Tonic. Cheers. Today's case takes us to Earl's Court, London. London, baby. And we are going all the way back 100 years. And it is a spicy, spicy banger. Let's go. I'm never sure how much these bits and bobs add to the old uh, G and Dizzle, but it smells lovely. Mm. Without further ado, let us go to 13A Finborough Road, Earls Court, London. Now, this was the home of Miss Gertrude Yates, also known as Olive Young, to her customers. She was 25 years old and she was a lady of the night. Gertrude was a successful lady of the night because she seemed to have taken prostitution and sex work and taken it to another level. So she was more of a high class, cool girl, if you like. She had regular clientele and she made a successful business out of, you know, her profession. I, I don't know how else to say it, but she did. She She was a cut above the rest. And she ended up earning enough money to rent her flat, 13A, Finborough Road, and also live quite a nice lifestyle. She never went without. She had a maid. She had a maid who came every morning. She also owned quite a lot of nice jewellery that she'd afforded herself. And her clientele were affluent men, always. So she was also often treated quite nicely, and she'd be treated to trips out and shows and yeah she was treated well. On the 6th of March 1922 Emily Steele, this was Gertrude's maid, would arrive at 13A Finborough Road London to clean the basement flat as she did every day. When she walked in she noticed that there was a gentleman's coat and scarf on a table in the sitting room, not unusual for the clients of Olive Young, Gertrude, I don't know what to call her. Maybe in her work capacity, she's Olive. So when Olive was working, it was quite common for her to have gentlemen visitors stay overnight. Emily went into the kitchen where she made herself some breakfast, probably a cup of tea, and then she set about starting her work day. So that involved cleaning and tidying. So she started in the sitting room. While she did so, the gentleman that was in Olive's boudoir came out of the bedroom, closed the door and walked towards Emily. Now, Emily recognised this man as somebody that she had seen in the flat before. When he spoke to Emily, he told her not to disturb Miss Young because they had basically been at it until the early hours and that she was going to be tired and she was in a deep sleep. So to just leave her be, let her rest and that he would send a car for her at midday. Emily helped him into his coat and then he gave her half a crown for helping him get a taxi the last time he was there. And then he left and Emily watched him go down the road and hail a taxi at the end of the road. Emily ignored the gentleman's wishes and she went straight to the bedroom and knocked on the door. She went in, she noticed that it seemed like Gertrude was asleep in the bed and then she went over and she opened the curtains. When she did this, things started to become a bit like, what, what, what? And the bed suddenly looked rather suspicious. Don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. Emily pulled back the eider down, and on doing so, she revealed a sight. Not what you're thinking. In the bed were two pillows, end to end, you know, head to, to bottom, to make it look like somebody was laying in the bed under the covers. What was grim was that these pillows were saturated with blood. Mm. In fact, so was the bed under the underdown. Underdown, eiderdown. That is a good word, isn't it? Eiderdown. The eiderdown. Oh, let's pull up the eiderdown. There's a chill in the air. Surprising enough, yes. Also in the bed was a rolling pin, which was too covered in blood. As she took in the scene she realised that the place had been ransacked and there were drawers taken out and there was stuff flung everywhere just yeah like the place had been gone through 
She then quickly checked the jewellery box, which she knew where that was. It was in the wardrobe in that bedroom. And lo and behold, that was empty. So this guy, it looks very much like, has just cleared Gertrude out. Also, where is Gertrude? Because there is blood everywhere. There is blood on the head of the bed, all over the bed, up the wall, all over the ceiling. There's a broken cup on the floor next to the bed, not to mention the rolling pin. Eh. Emily looked on the floor and noticed that there was a trail of blood leaving the room. So she followed this and it led her to the bathroom. And there was a blood stain on the wall next to the bathroom door. And then she opened the bathroom door and this is where she would find the body of Gertrude. She was laying naked on the floor next to the bathtub and she had the cord of her own dressing gown tied incredibly tightly around her neck. Emily was gone. She ran out of that flat quick as a flash and she went in to get the landlady and the police. The first inspector on the scene actually hopped on his bicycle to come down to the crime scene. He was there first, followed quickly by another detective and Dr Lee, who was the pathologist. He gave her time of death between 7.30 that morning and 8.30. So really not very long before... I've just had a thought. Hmm. Anyway, not very long. I'll come back to that. But not very long before... Emily had arrived at the, the flat. Emily was interviewed extensively. She also noticed when she came back to the flat that there was more missing. So there was quite a bit of money missing. So he'd taken that too. Emily gave a description of the gentleman caller and she also recollected, is that English, from the previous visit that he had called himself or introduced himself as Major True. Let me tell you right now, okay, because this shocked me to the core. Things moved so quickly, considering we're talking a hundred years ago, because this story was in the newspaper that morning, that morning in the newspaper. Say what? I mean, it was great actually, because somebody called ex chief inspector Stockley got in contact with the investigators quickly, as soon as he heard the news, because Stockley now worked as a private investigator, a PI, and he had been employed by Ronald True's family, his mother and his wife, to be exact, to find, his, find him. He'd gone missing, and they were incredibly worried about him. And now, all of a sudden, his name pops up as a suspect in a murder inquiry. Ooh, uh. He gives the police everything he knows about Ronald True. And quite worryingly, one of those facts is that Ronald carries a loaded pistol with him at all times. So he is armed and quite possibly dangerous, clearly, because the autopsy... Mm, mm -mm. Firstly, it showed five wounds to Gertrude's right side of her head. And it, it would suggest that when she had been in bed, laying in bed, she had turned to her side to drink her tea and had been hit about the, the right side of her head when she had done that, hence the broken cup on the floor. So very unsuspecting. She was just trying to have a cuppa. Death by tea. All five blows, five blows, were very forceful, very brutal, and all were deemed enough to have killed her. However, they did not kill her. Her cause of death was, in fact, strangulation, and the cord, her dressing gown cord round her neck, being tied very, very tightly. That is not all, because there is rage. There is rage in this one. The killer had also taken a towel or a piece of towel and forced it down her throat incredibly violently all the way down so this true is seeming like a very dangerous chappy indeed very very quickly a big manhunt is underway especially in and around london like i said things work quick i mean he wasn't going to get very far they were on it that morning the police tracked down the taxi driver that had picked True up from the end of Finbury Road and he he was helpful so he said that he had dropped True 
at Holmes Taylor's. This was in Coventry Street, London. London. Coventry. True had actually paid the taxi man to wait outside for him. And then the taxi man took him to a barber shop to have a shave. And then he was paid in full. And that was the end of that for the taxi man. So the police head to Holmes Taylor's to speak to the people that work there. The salesman that works at the shop, he said that True had come in and he had purchased a suit and he had changed into it there and then that morning because the suit that he was wearing was covered in blood. He told the tailor that he had been in a flying accident earlier that morning and injured himself. Seems random, I know. And they didn't question this because when he walked into the shop, he was he was walking with a limp. Ronald then met with a chap called Armstrong. Now, they had struck up a friendship. They were quite close, actually. Armstrong was a homeless man, out of work homeless man, but they had become best friends. The pair of them then went to a fella called Luigi Giuseppe Mazzola. Mazzola, excuse me. Now, he was, he worked in a garage, a motor garage, but he would also like have a side hustle of driving, well, he, he, driving people about, you know, like a kind of like a private taxi, if you like. And he had been driving Ronald around for a little while now. So they went there to be picked up and driven. It's very posh, isn't it? Just have a driver, be driven around. That day, the police then, they're following the trail. They're following this guy. And they they go and speak to Luigi. He's very happy to share information with the police and he has nothing to hide. He's done nothing wrong. They search his car and they find two coats in the car. And these coats belong to Ronald. Just terrible feeling that I've called him Donald. My apologies if I have at any point. Can you hear the wind? Crumbs. In Ronald's coat, they find in the pockets. One pocket has a pearl necklace, the other has a diamond. That's water. I think we have a leak in the shed. I think we have a leak in the shed. Oh. Yeah, most definitely. I've just had an investigation. It is not a leak, it is the rain bashing hard against the uh, door. We're good. Makes it kind of like spooky, doesn't it? Ooh, if only could have done this on Halloween. Where was I? In the other pocket was a diamond watch and two gold brooches. Now it was all very tense because Luigi, he was like, I've only just dropped them off, you know. He had taken them to the Hammersmith Palace of Varieties. What a place in West London. Not long. So the police were like, right, let's jump in your car, let's go. Take us where you took him, where you dropped him off. Put your foot on it. What? Put your foot down. Gin will help. Just dawned on me that I've got to walk down, back down the garden in this. <sighs> I might camp here. The police arrived at 9 p.m. And I cannot stress this enough. This all happened like at the beginning of the day, 9 a.m. Emily was only just like arriving at work. She hadn't even found Gertrude's body yet. Now 9 p.m., not even 12 hours later, they're there, they get him, they arrest him. He was in a private box with Armstrong, taken in a show, and he went with them quite quietly. They did, he did have his gun, he had his pistol, but they, they held him by the hands and they took the pistol off of him and he was escorted out of the building and arrested. Later that very evening, he was charged with the murder of Gertrude Yates. Now, True was an interesting chap and I am conflicted with my feelings in this case because it was a hundred years ago and when you learn more about True it is quite clear that he had undiagnosed mental health issues that had been present from childhood and never dealt with a hundred years ago and it was just quite black and white you were either normal or you were insane and if you were insane it wasn't so much that you were very well supported, understood. It, it wasn't like it is now. True's mother was 16 when she had him and she was unwed. However, as time went on, she ended up wedding a very wealthy man. So then she had lots of money. 
She then wed another wealthy man and it was all a bit of a hoo-ha because she was a bit of a girl, really. She sort of had an affair, basically. She was already married to one fella and then she was trying to get married to another fella. You know, a bit messy, but she ended up with a lot of money. Because of this, True ended up going to private school. Now, in his earlier childhood, he'd been in trouble quite a lot. And there are some things that are just like red flag, red flag. But back then, I don't know, he used to harm animals. Okay. And he also was often involved in petty crime as a child. Another red flag. He then went to private school when his mum got some money and they kind of washed their hands of true because he had issues and he was not studious. He was not the person that they wanted at their school. So he ended up being, and I kid you not, this guy, I think, travelled the world. His mum would do anything to try and find, it's almost heartbreaking, really, because she knew that he had issues and nobody knew how to deal with this. So what she did was try very hard to find a place for True in the world. And because she had lots of money, she literally did that. She sent that guy everywhere. Let me read out where he went. This is only a few because I'm sure there was more. At first, he went to New Zealand to learn farming because he, he wasn't studious. So they were like, right, what should we do this one? And that didn't work out. So he came home. But he came home to the UK and went up to Yorkshire to, again, learn farming. But it's like, no, no, that didn't work. Mm -mm. Then he was shipped off to Canada, Mexico, Shanghai. I mean, come on. And in all of these places, he was never, ever able to succeed. Ever. He wasn't just sent there to like, oh, go and like, have a go. They would set up employment. It never, ever worked. He would be described as childish, odd, immature, young-minded, eccentric, a compulsive liar. And I don't doubt that today he would be somebody that we would consider to have learning difficulties, additional needs, mental health issues, you know, somebody that would need support. The lies and the warped perception of reality were quite worrying, and he would he would come up with tall tales, incredibly tall tales, and people would know that he was lying. And again, that is very childlike, isn't it? Like you know, kids play with that, don't they? They make up loads of lies. I used to do it, but mm, so you know, he was an odd odd character, no, and that nobody understood. And also, people were frightened of him. He returned to England in the First World War. And he joined the Royal Flying, that, oh God. And he was pretty useless. And I think he was, he was, this was the issue. He was pretty useless at everything. He wasn't studious. I do think he had learning difficulties. And he wasn't, he was an, uh, clumsy and oafy. Uh, is that a word? I don't know. I like it though. And he, he wasn't good with, at anything. Well, nothing that he'd tried, is, tried so far. It took him three attempts to pass the flying exam. And actually, it did really shock people that he even passed it. And I think worried people because he was shockingly bad. He was described in the Air Force as childish, odd, very unusual, immature. Also, as a very terrible flyer. And you're working with other people, it's kind of dangerous, isn't it? As a result, he did have a few accidents. The first of which were very were quite minor. I think the second ended him up in hospital with, again, a minor ailment. But the third one was bad. It left him with quite severe injuries. And also he was then discharged because he wasn't fit to work. And then yet again, he is left with no purpose, no job, no career, no prospects, nothing. As a result of this injury, he had, it was something to do with his leg and his hip, hence the old limpy limpy. Ah, it also meant that things were not going well for him at all, were they? It also meant that he ended up addicted to morphine. That's not what you need. There were moments of real darkness in True's life because when the reality of his life was forced upon him, so there would be moments when he couldn't just keep up he, he couldn't pretend to himself anymore, you know, that he was great and brilliant or that, you know, all of the lies that he'd made up. He told people that he'd saved, rescued people from a train robbery. It wasn't true. 
there was a lot of lies. But when he was faced with the reality, which must happen momentarily, he would fall into incredibly dark depressions. So he would threaten to commit suicide. He would cry. He would break down. He would binge on drugs. In the May of 1917, True would go out to the US of A. Yet another country, another, you know, let's try here. He would meet an aspiring actress named Frances Abima Roberts. She was only 17 and they quite quickly got married. Same story, he couldn't hold down a job at all in America, so they quickly returned to the UK. When they arrived in the UK, his mum swiftly found him employment in West Africa. I mean, it's like a game of risk, this, all over the place. Two months later, he was suspended and he returned to the UK with his wife and they and now son as well. They'd had a, a baby together, Ronald True Jr. It's cute. At this point, it would seem that his mother gave up the ghost. She realised that True needed help and he would spend two years in and out of rehab centres. It was all probably a bit taboo. And this was for his morphine addiction. True's mum started to see him in a very different way. She'd always tried to... I, I, th I think make him normal. She thought like if I can just get him settled in a job, if he can just find employment. It was always about employment and it never worked. When his depression got so much and so bad and the drug addiction was running very deep, she started to see him for what he really was and she stopped pushing employment upon him and realised that he needed this professional help. She also gave him an allowance and she had been the entire time. The allowance is the equivalent in today's money of about 40 grand a year. So he had plenty and she resigned herself to the fact that that was how he would live. Drew's mind had began to break. So he, he created this other man that was impersonating him. Now, and he would tell a lot of people about this. So he actually, he told other people there was a physical other him person trying to impersonate him. But really in his mind, it was a way of, uh, you know, like anything he didn't like. It was, oh, that was, that's, oh, that's him. This is this other me. So he was palming it off because he couldn't cope. His brain was breaking. For example, he would rack up like quite a lot of debt. And that would be the other Ronald True. Sounds all right, doesn't it? Make a mistake. Oh, that that wasn't me. That was the other Sophie. Okay. This is very much just untreated mental health issues. People that had previously thought he was odd, eccentric, like, you know, not all there, they started to just look at him and think, no, oh, he's truly insane. And True started to use this other Ronald as... The part It was the part of his brain that doubted him, that didn't believe the lies that he was telling and the, the part of him that was a failure. And then in 1922, this highly vulnerable and dangerous, because let's be real, I am painting a picture. It is sad. It is sad. These things are sad. There are people that do not get the help and support that they need today let alone 100 years ago, it was awful back then because these people, when they didn't understand what these things were, were just put in horrible, awful conditions sometimes and experimented on for the rest of their days or until they were killed by it. So it's vile. And now there are still people that don't get the support they need. They don't get the help that they need. They don't have family maybe around them to even see these things so that they can get the support that they need. And it can be awful. And these people then without treatment and support, yeah, they do do vile, awful things sometimes. Does not mean that it's right, but it does mean that they have been let down and they have been failed. And it's not just those people that are failed, it is their victims as well. It's a big pile of mess. How many cases have we seen in the last 100 where people that clearly should not be out on the street, they should not be unsupported, then go on to 
murder or murder again. It's like, come on. When True goes missing, this is when his mother and his wife employ the services of Stockley to find him because they are fully aware at this point of how dangerous he is. True was exhibiting incredibly worrying behaviour, even more so at this point. He was stalking women. It seemed like it would be quite short-lived and then he would move on. One lady was Mrs Elizabeth Wilson. I'm not sure where they met, but I know that it involved dancing, so probably a dance hall. And when he met her, I I feel like it was just very polite meeting. And then he just went, whoa, whoa. Like he couldn't read the social situation very well. And he was like, yeah, gung-ho. So he would say, he'd show her his gun. His the literally the gun, not that's not a metaphor. And he would say, jokingly, but kind of not jokingly, about killing her husband, right? He didn't like her dancing with anybody else. So it was like he met this woman, she was probably just a bit nice to him, and then he was like, Mine. Mmm, it's creepy, isn't it? It's scary. And he would not leave her alone. When I say stalking, it's like, yeah stalking he got hold of her number he would ring all the time like ring her house to speak to her he would tell stories that made him look good but they were quite violent and the the violence and the talk of violence really became in at this point so when he disappeared this is when this violent like thoughts were in his mind. He was often talking about killing the impersonator, but he would talk about killing other people and it almost felt like imminent that he wanted to kill somebody. Mrs Wilson was terrified of him and his behaviour and then he moved on and this is when he had met Olive Young. He met Olive on a night out in London on the 18th of February initially. He employed her services and he did not make a good impression. He stayed the night, but it seemed very much like Olive was quick to get him out of there. She did not like his behaviour. He was incredibly odd. All of the above, he was odd and he frightened her. And I think, imagine that, like somebody that misreads signals and situations you know so much so that just this Mrs Wilson he's he thinks they're a lot more than what they are and then imagine him with a prostitute I mean oh he must have thought they were going to get married next week not the one so she was scared and she knew something was off so off he went thank you bye-bye and then when he'd left she realized that he'd nicked a fiver out of her bag so he'd, he'd stolen from her as well what? I mean, did he pay her? And then, and then Nick, I'm not sure, but he'd stolen money from her. Now, Olive is a businesswoman. She's like, not again, no thanks. Yeah, no, not for me. Little did she know who she had just met, because he did not leave her alone. He called the flat all the time. He he called it all the time to talk to her. And she never answered. She never spoke to him. So then he upped the ante. I mean, this time he knows where she lives. He would often be outside her flat, hoping that she would one time let him in. Red flag. This behaviour got worse and worse and worse because it ended up that he would be outside of her flat multiple times a day. She would always ignore him. She would never let him in until the 5th of March and no one knows what happened that evening and why she let him in but she did. Now the pathologist Dr Lee had given the time of death at as 7.30 I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Whoa my face nearly came off. Oh squeaky. Now what was I saying? <laughs> Dr Lee he gave the time of death between 7.30 a.m and 8.30 a.m. That means that True spent the night with with Olive. They, you know, they spent the night together. He didn't murder her there and then on entering the apartment that evening, flat. He, you know, what a grim one. Yeah, but he made her a cup of tea, them. He 
as she went to drink it, he beat her around the head five times. And then it's almost like the anger then kicked in. So that would have killed her. But then shoving the towel down her throat very forcibly is anger and rage. I reckon that those two weeks where she ignored him and wouldn't let him in, I think it all just came bubbling out and he was cross and angry with her. True's trial began on the 1st of May in 1922. There was a lot of evidence against him. So Emily, the witness, the tailors that said about his suit being covered in blood. Oh, and that reminds me of going back, right back to the beginning, you know, when I was like, ah, oh, thought, yeah. Emily, did she not notice? Now, I'm thinking she did because he was covered in blood and she watched him down to the end of the road. I think she knew. I think she knew. That makes sense to me, doesn't it? Because she goes straight. He says like, oh, don't go and wake her up. Covered in freaking blood. Yeah, don't worry, I won't. Uh, I think she knew. It's just that in my research, it wasn't like, it, that, it was a long time ago, wasn't it? But yeah, I think that's what happened. Because I was going to say, like, it didn't, she, it didn't seem that she mentioned the suit covered, what? The covered suit blood? Who? <laughs> the covered, the suit blood what no the blood covered suit that took that was something else worrying what is in this gin she says give me more but yeah she would have noticed it because she helped him with his coat as well so it wasn't like he had his coat on no no so he was he had blood on him Ugh. She probably watched him down the road to make sure he wasn't going to come back and finish her off and then went to help Gertrude. He'd also pawned her jewellery, not the jewellery that they found in his coat, but other pieces of jewellery. He'd done that that day. Mrs Wilson testified at his trial against him about his like worrying and frightening behaviour. In fact, there were so many people that testified in his case. The driver, Mazzola, Luigi, he stood he took the stand and he said that in the weeks leading up to the murder, his talk about violence increased a lot, often about the impersonator, but it seemed like he just had violence on the mind all of the time. He also said that he had dropped True outside that flat on numerous occasions. Emily identified him in court. Yep, that's the one. And also, he'd showed somebody a floor plan, like he'd drawn out a floor plan of a flat and said, this is, I've got, you know, this is where the impersonator lives and I'm going to, I'm going to kill him there. And it was Emily's, not Emily's, Sophie, Gertrude's flat. In court, he seemed to be having a, a very nice time and he took with him a rubber ducky and a champagne cork he'd have he'd have those things with him for his court appearances and he seemed jovial and honestly it, in the pictures it looks like he's just like not really understanding to be honest he's not really get, getting the full weight of what's occurring his defense found it a bit of a struggle so they had to go down the route of insanity and that was not a simple task at the time because there were certain laws in place you couldn't just be insane. You, it had to be proved that you were insane at the time of the murder, but also that you were insane enough to not understand that what you were doing was wrong. I think I've got that right. Well, some laws, honestly, are like, all right, all right, what? So that was that was what they had to prove, that he didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. Because even if you were certified insane, for example, let's just say back in the day, 100 years ago, but you knew right from wrong, even though you were insane in the membrane, you would still be sent, uh, sentenced to death because you knew right from wrong. So insanity was not just like a get out of jail free card. Again, they called many, many, many witnesses. There was hospital staff, prison staff from when he'd been in prison a few times, all to certify that he was insane. There were a lot of people that said, yeah, he's insane. They even had 
I think it was three experts from a local insane asylum in London that all separately said, yeah, he's insane. But that is enough. It's not enough. And the prosecution would argue that that he had, what's happened? That he had tried to conceal what he'd done, which would suggest that he knew it was wrong. He had told Emily not to go in the room. Don't wake her. Right? He told her that. And he had put pillows in the bed to pretend that she was in there. So that's an act of concealment. So is not telling Emily, oh, she's dead, or killing her as well. Okay? And then also buying a new suit. So buying the suit that was covered and giving them the one covered in blood, which he took with him, by the way. They wrapped it up and he took it with him. But the fact that he lied about what, what, why he needed a new suit... But the defence argued that these were childlike acts of concealment, which I suppose they are. He didn't try very hard. I mean, pillows in the bed, as if she wasn't going to find her in the bathroom. He didn't hide her body at all. He just left her in the bathroom. And I... so it was it was almost sort of silly acts of concealment, if you like, just, yeah, like childlike they weren't going to they were never going to stop the truth from coming out but equally you can argue that the fact it's like a child that's got chocolate around their mouth and then the, i didn't eat it like do you know what i mean he it was childlike it was he, he, he there was a part of his brain that must have known that that wasn't okay otherwise he would have just to me a truly insane insane person in that moment that didn't understand what they had done wrong would have just done it and just walked out of the flat and not done the pillows in the bed and not spoken to Emily blah 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 just ran and also probably if they didn't think they'd done anything wrong I don't know about the suit thing I don't know he was avoiding being caught so that is acts of concealment anyway the jury thought the same because they convict they thought he was guilty and he was sentenced to death the day of his execution was set for the 16th of june which was his birthday he appealed on the 24th of may and that was rejected denied and it really didn't seem like he fully grasped what was going on he wrote a letter and he's he's quite cheery he's just like oh you know i'm going to die and yeah, not really comprehending. Two weeks before his execution, the Home Secretary asked for reports on his mental health. Three separate experts certified him as insane. And on the 8th of June, it was decided that he would not be put to death in the gallows. Instead, he was taken to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. That's a hard word to say. You don't know how many times I've just sat here and tried to say it. You do now. About seven. This caused controversy. He had been found guilty and he had been found guilty correctly. Like in terms of the law and what it said in the law, he had tried to conceal what he had done, which would suggest that he knew it was wrong and therefore he should be sentenced to death. So people were a bit like, well, that's not right, which you can understand, I suppose, but mm, a, a really tricky one. True spent the rest of his life in Broadmoor. He was popular there. He was well liked. He enjoyed gardening. He was part of the theatre group, which he thoroughly enjoyed. And it really would seem like True was finally where he was meant to be. And I almost find that like a bit heart-wrenching because there are there are it's very grey, this one, isn't it? It's not just black and white. You know, it doesn't excuse it's so I find it really difficult. It doesn't forgive the fact of what he has done. But he was failed as well massively and those failings tip down don't they they step down into into other layers 
And then when he's placed in Broadmoor and he's looked after and supported, he flourishes as a human being. And isn't that what we want for all human beings? On the 7th of January in 1951, True passed away from a heart attack. He was 59 years old. And that is all I have for you on today's case. 100 videos, baby. Yes, 100. Thank you so much, everybody, because without you, it wouldn't be possible. And I love doing this very, very much. I'm not going to cry, not going to cry. But um, yeah, I love it a lot. I have come up to this shed all sat in the dining room and spoken to you. And wow, 100. Oh, that sounded grim. And I've loved every freaking minute. Thank you so much for joining me for another 100 episode of Sin and Tonic. Hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a glass with beautiful fruit segments of gin. I will not be with you next week, sadly, because it is essay week. We have reached that point and I need to get my nut down and really crack on and make sure I write an astounding couple of essays. So... That's going to be my focus next week. I will miss you, but it will be beautiful the following week to come back when that is all done and the first assignments are out of my life. And we can celebrate together with a Jin, with a Ron. Have I told you lately that I love you? You are the best. I'm very, very lucky. I'm going to go and I'm going to make myself another Jin because 100 videos, are you joking? I'm celebrating, baby. All the lipstick around that glass vial. Oh! Peppercorn. I've just overwhelmed myself with emotion. 100 videos. I don't know why I've, I've, it's such a big thing for me, but it's like 100 videos. 100. Uh, 100. And I just love it. And I get to do it every week. Apart from next week. And that makes me very happy, but also a bit emotional. And I wouldn't be able to do it if you didn't watch, so thank you. I'm going to go because otherwise I'm going to get emotional, I'm going to do ugly crying. <sighs> Jin will help. You are the best. I love you so much. I'm losing my voice. I'm going to go and I will see you all, not next Friday, but the Friday after, with a stay, happiness, and another terrifying tale. Bye.